If you've got a copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2 as we continue our series on the Acts of the Holy Spirit. If you've got a smart device or tablet, we're going to be in an amplified version. The passages that will be on the wall for you to look at and also for those of you joining us online on your screen will also be from the amplified version. As we continue to look at Peter's message at Pentecost, I shared with you last Sunday that if you were to take and read the passages that we have that records just a portion of his sermon, you could probably read it in about five minutes. But we're taking three weeks to really unpack it as we look at how the Holy Spirit worked in the birth of the church there in Jerusalem on that day. Last week when we were together, we looked at when prophecy meets divine purpose. As Peter, this fisherman who had not been radically changed or had been not been radically trained and had been sitting under the teaching ministry of Jesus for three plus years, begins to quote verbatim what the prophet Joel had spoken over 800 years prior to what had happened there in Jerusalem that day. And so as he did that, we were seeing in that where prophecy met divine purpose. What Joel had prophesied would take place actually happened there in the upper room as the Holy Spirit comes and fills those that are there in the room. And they began to do things beyond their ability as the Holy Spirit works in and through their lives. And so as we left off last week in part one of this three-part series on this sermon, we talked about the reality that as Peter is building this sermon... He's going to be building it from the foundation of God's Word. Every good sermon, every good preacher knows that what you're preaching and what you're teaching better be founded on the Word of God. He's giving them the Word of God from Joel. Now today, he's going to give them even more of the Word of God from the book of Psalms, Psalm 16 and Psalms 110. As today, we looked at the king's message melts men's hearts. Last week, the divine purpose of prophecy. Today, the message melts the hearts of men that comes from the king. But the king that we're talking about is not King Jesus, it's King David. David, a thousand years before the recording of this sermon that Peter is preaching, had made prophetic utterances about the Messiah that would come. And what Peter is going to do with those listeners that day is show them how all of that has been fulfilled right there in their very midst. And he's actually going to say to them that you all are witnesses to the fulfillment of Scripture to the prophecy from a 1,000 years ago, the prophecy from 800 years ago through David and through Joel have all been fulfilled in these days, and they are witnesses. Today, as we turn our hearts, we're going to look back at verse number 21 from last week, and then we're going to begin in our new block of Scripture, beginning in verse number 25. Hopefully, you've found your way there, and if you're ready for God's Word, let me hear you say, I am. Peter says, and it shall be that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, invoking, adoring, and worshiping Lord Jesus, shall be saved, rescued spiritually. This is one of those things, I don't don't know how many of you have ever been to a church service or maybe a memorial service, and a preacher has been preaching. And as he's preaching, and as you're listening, and as you're following along, you're thinking, man, that would be a great place to stop right there. But they didn't stop. I've been at memorial services where family have gotten up and shared and preachers have gotten up and say, well, I don't know how I could do any better than that. And 30 minutes later, they're still trying to do better than that. Y'all can laugh. It's okay. I've been accustomed to doing that sometimes myself. But it's really one of those things that if Peter had just said that right there, that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, and every one of y'all under the sound of my voice need to be saved, he could have given them a response right then. But Peter is not done yet. Peter is going to take that prophecy from Joel. He's going to show them how the fulfilling of the Holy Spirit coming, as he prophesied that the Lord said, I will pour out my spirit on both men and women, on bond and free. He says that we're going to show you that how the the old men and the young men will dream dreams and have visions. He's showing them precept upon precept of how what has just taken place in their midst, that they pose the question, whatever could this mean? He's showing them what this means. Now today we jump over and we begin looking at verse number 25. And Peter says, For David says of him, him being Jesus, him being the wanted that they were looking for, the Messiah to come. It says, For David says of him, I saw the Lord constantly before me, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken from my state of security. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue exulted exceedingly. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope, that is, will encamp in anticipation of the resurrection. For you will not forsake me and abandon my soul to Hades of the grave, the realm of the dead, nor will you let your Holy One undergo decay after death. As David is writing this, the casual listener would think that David is referring to himself. They knew that David was the anointed king, but David was not the anointed one. 
It's amazing when you trace the genealogy of Jesus. His genealogy goes all the way back to David. David, from David's time to the Babylonian exile, is 14 generations. From the end of the Babylonian exile up to the birth of Jesus, there's another 14 generations. And so for a thousand years, the Jews have been hearing this psalm from Psalm 16 read over and over. They had had rabbi after rabbi teach them over and over. But for those that were just casual listeners, every time David was talking in first person, they would have thought David was referring to himself. But look at what David says there in those scriptures. He says, the Lord is constantly before me. He is continually at my right hand. Now for David, the Lord was not physically and literally before him and at his right hand. This is not an Old Testament Christophany where David actually sees the pre-incarnate Christ. But what David is talking about is by faith, the Messiah was always before me. Now David did not know that the Messiah's name would be Jesus. But he says, he's always been before me. I've always been looking, and he's always been at my right hand. Why? Because of the faith he had in God to fulfill the Davidic covenant that he had made with him. God makes this covenant with David that he will establish his throne forever. And yet David dies. His son Solomon ascends to the throne, and then Solomon dies. And then we continue to trace generation after generation. And yet when Jesus comes, no one is looking for anyone from the line of David to be the one to sit upon the throne. David is now one of those men that is becoming not only a king, but he's also becoming a prophet because what he is saying in that scripture, he's prophesying about what is yet to come. And as he's making that prophecy, he says, the Lord was always before me and he is always beside me and I will not be shaken. Hey, Christ follower, guess who's always before you? Christ. Guess who's always beside you? Christ. Guess who makes it possible for you to not to be shaken? Christ. I see y'all out there waving those fans, and I know it's hot in here. My office hadn't had air conditioning in three weeks. I know it's hot, but stay with me. I know this is what happens when y'all start getting warm, y'all start getting sleepy. Some of y'all had danishes with your coffee. Just hang with me. We're going to get there. David is trying to lay out in this prophecy that though I'm not literally seeing him, he's always in front of me. Though he's not literally with me, he's always beside me. And because of that, I'm not going to be shaken. And look at what he says, moreover. He says, I rejoiced in my heart. My tongue has exulted or praised him exceedingly. My flesh will live in hope, for you will not forsake me or abandon my soul to Hades, nor let your Holy One undergo decay. Now, as David is writing about that, again, the casual listener, if they're not really in tune to what is being said in the Scripture, they're not getting what David is saying. David, again, is not talking about himself. He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about the Messiah. This is the message of the king that in time is going to melt the hearts of those that are listening. He's trying to get the foundation built that they're going to get to in just a few moments because look at what he says in verse number 28. He says, you have made known to me the ways of life. You will fill me, infusing my soul with joy with your presence. David, now speaking of himself, says this is what God has done in my life. Because God has been so good, because God has been so faithful, because God has always done that which he said he will do. He says, out of that, there has been this, this feeling within me and this joy that I find in your presence. Let me encourage you. Some of you are going through hard times right now. Some of you are fighting obstacles and you're going through battles right now. Keep your focus on Jesus. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Let his presence be more powerful than your problems. And don't ever think because you've got problems that he's absent. Because sometimes when he's absent, that's when you're going to find him to be the most present. And he's going to be the most present because you're going to sense him in a way. Now, the Holy Spirit is always with you. But there are times that drive you into a deeper walk of faith than you've had. If it was not for the valleys, we'd never appreciate the mountaintops. And so as they're going through, as he's laying this out for them, again, I don't think y'all really can understand just how amazing this is that this fisherman named Peter is preaching and quoting scripture the way that he's quoting it. I shared with you last week, Peter did not wake up that morning and say, you know what, I think I'll go preach my first sermon. But in the moment that he stood up, Luke 12, 12 was fulfilled. Jesus said to those men, give no thought for what you will say, for in that moment the Holy Spirit will give you the words that you need to say. Peter's not prepared, Peter's not ready, but Peter's ready and Peter's prepared. And he gets up and he begins to share. And look at what he says in verse number 29. Brothers, I may confidently and freely say to you regarding the patriarch David 
that he has both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Again, Peter is getting the casual listener to understand that the earlier passage, David wasn't talking about himself. Because the reality of it is, when he says that you will not allow your anointed one to see corruption, nor will you leave him in the grave, David is still in the grave. He says, guys, it's been a thousand years since the reign of David. We know that he died. Not only was he dead, but he was buried. Not only was he buried, but we know where they buried him. He's pointing out all the obvious to get them to understand the things that they're missing in the midst of this. He says, you need to understand what David is referring to, that he is talking about another one other than himself. See, it's the message of the king, but the king is not pointing to himself. King David's pointing to Jesus, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he says to him, he continues on in verse 30 and 31, and so being a prophet, talking about King David, he was a man of war, he was a man of battle. Very few times that we ever see where David is referred to as a prophet, but this is one of the times. He was a prophet because he prophetically spoke about what was going to happen when the Messiah come. He said that being a prophet and knowing fully that God has sworn to him with an oath that he would seat one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke prophetically. In other words, because David took God at his word, he was able to make the prophetic statements that he made because of his trust in him. And what did he say and what did he speak about? Of the resurrection of the Christ the Messiah, the anointed. In other words, the ones that all of you have come here at Pentecost that say you're still looking for. Because remember from last week, we have 15 different nationalities represented there in Jerusalem. We have 12 to 15 different dialects being spoken by these Galileans that now the Holy Spirit is enabling them to speak in known tongues. And they've all come to celebrate Pentecost. They all are devout Jews. They all know why they're there and what they're there for. But he says that as this is unfolding, he says to them that the resurrection of the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, that he was not abandoned in death to Hades, the grave, the realm of the dead, nor did his body undergo decay. Well, how is Peter able to make that statement? Because if you go back 50 days up from the grave, he arose. <laughs> he spends 40 days with his disciples. Over 500 people attest to seeing the resurrected Christ. And then for 10 days, they're there in Jerusalem. They're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. And so everything that David said he would do for his anointed one, referring to God, God did for his anointed one because the grave couldn't hold him. He didn't leave him in the grave. His body didn't see decay. When he came out, he had the glorified body. And he is there and he spends time with them. And now as Peter is preaching this message to them, in verse 32, he says emphatically, God raised this Jesus bodily from the dead. And of that fact, we all are witnesses. Now this is an interesting statement that Peter makes. When he makes the statement that God raised this Jesus, not anybody else named Jesus, but this Jesus. He says when he raised him bodily from the dead, that we all are witnesses to the fact could it be for just a moment? Maybe some of that crowd that had gathered that day, that day were not just there on that day. Could it be that they were gathered also on the day of Passover? That they were there when Jesus was brought through the Via Della Rosa up Golgotha? Could it be that some of them were the ones that actually took and threw stones at him, that ridiculed him, that plucked the hair from the beard off of his face from him? Could it be that some of those were the ones that may have even heard the centurion say, surely this was the Son of God? But regardless of whether or not any of those in that crowd were like that, we know that there were 120 in the apostles that were there. They had spent time with the resurrected Jesus. They knew that Jesus didn't see decay. Because look at what he says. God raised this Jesus, and it's a fact that we all are witnesses. Let me let you in on a little secret. If you profess to be a Christ follower, you didn't physically see Jesus raised from the dead. You didn't physically see Jesus ascend to sit at the right hand of the Father. But by faith, you've believed it. And though you didn't visibly see it, audibly you've heard it. And now every one of you in the room, whether you are a professed Christ follower or you're far from God, you are witness to the resurrection of Jesus because you've heard the truth from God's word that this Jesus, who is this Jesus? This Jesus of the Bible. That he did what? He raised him from the dead. And now we all are witnesses. Let me ask you the question, what kind of witness are you? Are you a good witness or are you a bad witness? 
See, every lawyer, when they're defending someone, they want witnesses that will build a defense for their defendant. And the reality of it is not every lawyer always gets what they want. Sometimes they get defendants and sometimes they get witnesses that the stories don't line up, only to find out when they're on trial that that witness doesn't have a clue what they're talking about, that that witness didn't even see what's being talked about in the courtroom that day. See, for you and I as professed Christ followers, we should be ready, we should be prepared to give a defense for the hope that is within us. Why? Because he said, you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. The question is, my friend, what kind of witness will you be? Will you be a good witness to the gospel of Christ or will you be a bad witness to the gospel of Christ? Peter goes on after saying that statement in verse 33. He says, therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out his blessings, which you both see and hear. What is Peter talking about? He's talking about the blessing of the Holy Spirit. How were they seeing it? They were seeing these Galileans. How were they hearing it? They were hearing these Galileans that were not trained in dialects, speaking all these different languages about the mighty works of God. See, what Peter is doing as he's preaching, he's building precept upon precept. He's given him prophecy from a thousand years ago with David. He's given prophecy from 800 years ago with Joel. And now he's taking them to current time, 54 days back to where they are now. And he says, and now you all are witnesses to it. You say you believe what the word of God teaches us. You say you believe the message of the prophets. Well, the prophecy has been fulfilled. Prophecy has met divine purpose. And what Peter is doing, Peter is preaching the king's message. He's preaching the king's message because the king's message must always go forth. But David's message was not about him. It was about Jesus. And so he says to them then, verse number 34 and 35, for David did not ascend into heaven, yet he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool to your feet. Now here again, this is Psalms 110 that David, that Peter is quoting about David. And look at what he says. And I love how the Amplified explains this. He says, the Lord being the father said to the Lord being the son, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This, again, is a part of the king's message that's going to melt the hearts of men. Because now the very one that they were to be looking for, the Messiah, the anointed one, they are the very ones that took him to death. They are the ones that failed to embrace the ministry of Jesus. And yet Jesus is the one that the death could not hold him. Jesus is the one that the Father exalted to sit at the right hand beside him. And Jesus is the one that he says, I will make your enemies a footstool for your feet. How much greater of an enemy could you be to anyone than to be someone's murderer? These that are hearing this message are beginning to connect the dots. This message of the king's message is beginning to melt the hearts of men. In verse 36 and 37 Peter just keeps hammering them. Therefore, let all the house of Israel recognize. Who is Peter talking to? Devout men from every tribe and known under the heavens. Devout men that were there for Pentecost. Devout men that were part of the house of Israel. He says, therefore, let all the house of Israel recognize beyond all doubt that God has made him both Lord and Christ, Messiah and anointed, this Jesus whom you crucified. What a great point for a dramatic pause from the preacher. He's been laying out the message of the king. He's been laying out how Jesus was the fulfillment of the prophecy. And now he says to them, whom you crucified. Now then, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart with remorse and anxiety. In other words, they realized what they had done. See, there's a big difference between being sorry because you got caught and being sorry for what you did. And there's a big difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. These men that are listening to this message, they're falling underneath the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They have this conviction that's in them to the point that their hearts are pricked. Their hearts are cut by the message with remorse and anxiety. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, brothers, what are we to do? Can I tell you that anytime someone comes under conviction of the Holy Spirit about their relationship with the Lord, 
and they see themselves for who they are, and they see Jesus for who he is, that will always be the response, whatever should I do? In other words, because what you've pointed out to me is truth, how do I deal with it? How do I deal with the guilt? How do I deal with the shame? How do I deal with the reality that I'm a sinner in the hands of an angry God? They look at Peter and the apostles and say, brothers, whatever are we to do? Verse number 38, Peter said to them, repent. Change your way of thinking. Turn from your sinful ways. Accept and follow Jesus as the Messiah. In other words, you've come to the point you realize that you're a sinner, then you repent of your sins. Don't repent that you got caught, but repent because of what you did that you got caught doing. He looks at him and says, you want to know what you need to do? Keep going to the temple. Keep going to the services. Keep offers and sacrifices. Keep finding a way that you can serve. Mm -mm. He doesn't say any of that, but that's what we try to do. We get under conviction. I just need to go to some more church services. I just need to find a way to serve the church. Instead of dealing with the conviction we're under. Peter says to them, repent. And then he says, be baptized. Each of you in the name of Jesus Christ because of the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> you know, it's amazing so many times when a message will be preached, people will get under conviction, not because of the messenger, but because of the message and the enemy will instantly begin to work in a person's life. This is how the enemy will begin to work in a person's life. You know what, what that preacher just said is true, but that's not about you. That's about somebody else. You know what they've been doing, and it's a whole lot worse than what you've been doing. And that whole message about repentance, just say you're sorry. Can I tell you that Jesus didn't die for you to say you're sorry? He knew you were sorry. That's why he died. Sometimes we got to get to the point that we don't just say, I'm sorry, but we follow that up with another step. Well, you know, preacher, I, uh, I've been coming to this church for a while, and you Baptists are all the same. You, just, you think people need to be baptized by immersion. Yeah, we do. That's why we're Baptists. It's kind of what the Word teaches us. Well, you know, preacher, I just, I just don't think that applies to me. Me and God's got a deal worked out, and I just don't think I should take that next step and be baptized and go up under that water. I just, I just don't think that's necessary. Can I tell you, we only have a recording of one person in the Bible that it wasn't necessary for them to be baptized. He was hanging on the cross beside Jesus. He didn't go to hermeneutics class. He didn't go to seminary. He didn't give anything to a building fund. He didn't get baptized. He didn't wear church merch. He just said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say? Surely I say to you, you'll be with me in paradise. See, folks, let me tell you something. The enemy will always try to convince you to not take your next step. Because if he can convince you to not take your next step, you'll stay right where you are. And you never know what he might use and how he might use it in somebody else's life. Peter says, you want to know what you need to do? You need to repent. You need to be baptized. And then you'll receive the Holy Spirit. See, it works a little bit differently for you and I. We repent, we pray to receive Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit, and when we receive the Holy Spirit, He quickens us to want to be baptized. He gives us that desire to be baptized. And so as Peter is there and the other 11 apostles are there, you've got hundreds and thousands of people that are all asking the same question, brothers, what are we to do? And Peter and the apostles are given the exact same message. Repent. Be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. And then in verse number 39, for the promise of the Holy Spirit is for you. It's for your generation. But it's not just for you, it's for your children. It's for the next generation. But it's not just for you and for your children. He says, and for all those who are far away. He says, including the Gentiles. As many as the Lord our God calls to himself. Pay close attention to what Peter just said. For all who are far away, we are hundreds of years removed from this message being preached, and yet it's still relevant for us today. 
We are thousands of miles removed from the Holy Land in Israel, and yet it still applies to us today. He says, when it comes to the point that you call upon the name of the Lord, what did Joel say? Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And when we call upon the name of the Lord, as many as the Lord our God calls to himself, and even those who are far away from God can still be saved. These men that are there that day, they're hearing the king's message And it melts their heart to the point of them saying, whatever shall we do? And then Peter very clearly says what they need to do. You need to repent, you need to be baptized, and you need to receive the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you a question this morning for those of you in the room and for those of you that are joining us online. Has there ever been a time that you were cut to the heart like these men? Has there ever been a time that your heart got pricked like these men? You may have grown going to church your whole life. You may be serving in ministry right now, but you're just as cold as the day is long. There, there is no warmth. There, there is no compassion. There is no desire for the things of God. You're just cold to it. It just seems so far and so removed from you right now. But maybe today the king's message has melted your heart. Maybe today because of Peter showing where prophecy met divine purpose in those days has met divine purpose in these days. And you're seeing that who the Bible points to is not King David. Who the Bible points to is King Jesus. And maybe today is the day that you come to know him. Not just know about him, but to know him. Those men in that moment, they began to know a lot about Jesus. Next week when we get together, we're going to see that it goes from knowing about him to actually knowing him.